OK, thank you. So let's try to make it interactive. Today is, uh, you know, as Arvind said, I'm quite, uh, let's say, interested in looking at STEM in general in a way that I think inspires not just me, but everybody else, because I really think it's a very fascinating field. You know, find it very interesting how science meets engineering and does things which people like to do. Right. So it's really that the triangle of this thing is quite interesting. Today I'm going to talk about this tear down that I did. Now, one of the things I love to do, I really and I feel I'll hopefully I'll inspire more people to take it up is to take things apart to understand how they work, I mean, not take them apart to sort of release your stress or to break them in general. But once things stop working, you know, or they become obsolete, it's still a beautiful thing to look at because we can understand a lot of things. So today I'm going to look at this, you know, um, uh, webcam. Now, I hope you guys can see my camera. I actually took it apart again today to when I was preparing for this. But basically what I took apart was, let's say, this webcam here. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Is it is it better now? Yes. OK, so basically, you know, it was a webcam to start with like a round dish. You can see the picture picture on the screen as well. Uh, now that I've it actually took me again. I nearly got hurt today taking this out because that I, I didn't realize it was I had actually again fastened it. So anyway, uh, takes a little bit of energy to get it out, but it wasn't very hard once you understand the where the screws are placed. So it looks something like this, let's say to you know once it's closed. Uh, so the switch on top and is here and this other circle sort of goes here, right? So it looks like a ball. Um, and if you see inside, there are three, let's say, main parts. One is the the lens assembly, which is here, you know, which uh, got here. Now it turns out that I realized, and in fact, I realized part of it today that I can open this even further. So I can take this out. I can even take out the lens here. So we'll talk about this a little bit in a while. Um, but then that's the main sort of the, the 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 first thing. The second thing, which is visible once we remove the lens assembly, and you can see it now. Sorry, you can see it now is the image sensor, and I can you know see it. Let's say if I unscrew this, I'll be able to see it even more clearer. But I'm not doing it right now. But you can see it from this side that you know it's kind of visible here. And finally, there is this the main circuit board which I'm holding in my hand. You know, um, this is what it is. This basically contains the image processing chip. We'll talk about all of this as it gets along. But you know, this is what we are going to look at. So, any questions at this point, uh, others, uh, Arvind or uh, Shreyans? No. This is from Logitech. Yeah, this is from Logitech. No, no. And I, yeah, thank you. So this I bought this in 2006. So it was just lying around not doing anything at my house because now, you know, uh, laptops have cameras, phones have cameras. But back in the day when, in fact, I did not have a laptop then, uh, I had a desktop computer, which, you know, I needed to sort of um, connect to a webcam. I also had to get a wireless modem separately, by the way, because otherwise there was no uh, Wi-Fi router, uh, Wi-Fi, let's say, connectivity on my desktop. So sometime back. Now, the question is, how did it all start? How did I suddenly get interested in this? In general, I do tear downs quite regularly. Uh, I try to understand things, but sometimes I do it and, you know, uh, some like some events happen that motivate you. In this case, what happened was something very interesting. My daughter, who uh, now is in going to ninth standard, but she was in eighth standard and she had to make a projector. All right. So uh, that's how this whole thing started. We used a shoebox here. So the idea was we took a shoebox, took it apart, uh, put a lens over here. I, I think hopefully you can see it. and. You know, then we sort of dis built it and uh, just to test it, like I've, what I've done here is that I've put it, uh, put the projector on the, let's say on a flat surface, put my smartphone in there. And when I switch off the lights, you notice that I see an uh, image forming upside down. You can see it's an elephant here, some, some kind of animals because it was an African safari or something like that. And you notice that the, the image is upside down here, right? Because that's the property of the lens. So this is where I sort of started, you know, um, everything looks simple once it's fully built, but the process of building is usually not that straightforward. It goes through this own, uh, let's say, uh, challenges. So the first challenge that we sort of faced is, OK, how do I choose the lens now? now it turned out that I had, you know, at home, I had two lenses. One was this, uh, I think I had got it sometime back at very cheap, uh, let's say, magnifying glass available in my stationery shop. And one was a slightly more expensive one, which I finally used here uh, on this side, sorry. But then the, the I wasn't very sure which one to do. So I, you know, as I keep telling you guys in my classes as well, when not sure, try because at most things will go wrong. So in fact, we tried building with this lens, the bigger one here, right? It's, it's I, that's why I've taken it out. Um, and we just realized that this thing wouldn't work at all. I mean, I just couldn't get the picture to be appearing on the screen nicely and so on. 
Whereas when I looked at some YouTube videos, people said that, okay, you know, and most people don't explain the, the physics behind it, but it just works for them. So that's when it kind of got a little bit, uh, you know, I just uh, sort of uh, was forced to go a little bit deeper into this as to not every lens is born equal. But really the working principle for a projector is that, you know, if I put an image between, sorry, if I put an object between, let's say, F and 2F, which is a focal length, um, it's going to appear inverted on the other side beyond, let's say, 2F. So the question is, you know, uh, basically the idea, the point is I needed to find out the focal length of, let's say, this lens before I could use it. And once we know this, then there is this lens formula, which, you know, you will learn in, uh, let's say, uh, I'm not sure if she had learned it by then, but she had to make this so through this process she learned. In fact, she documented all this. I, I told her to document whatever we found uh, on top of the box. And that's what the ask from the school also was, which was quite nice because then you explain what's going on. Now, the question then comes, OK, so I need I realize that I need to know the focal length of this thing, but how do I find the focal length? Right. So one experiment I remembered from, let's say, you know, um, my childhood days is that if you take a lens and you guys can try this. In fact, it's quite nice. Uh, it, it's interesting. If I take a lens and put it in sunlight, then I'll find that the sunlight will get converged onto one point, and that distance is basically the focal length, right? Uh, I don't know if you've tried this before, but it's it's fun. It heats up things. You can even burn a newspaper with this. Uh, we did all that like sort of fun experiment because light just converges, and this is also the principle that's used, for example, in solar cookers. It's pretty much the same principle with some more, let's say, uh, nuances to it. But then it also means that if I have, let's say, you know, another way to find this and which I found more interesting, I'll talk about that, is that I could just look at the image that is formed on by this lens onto a plane because basically all the lines that are coming, all the rays that are coming parallel to this are converging, which means that if I have a scene over here, it will, like this diagram shows, it will form an image somewhere else and I can just read off, let's say, where that image forms with a given lens. So that's what I did. Uh, I'll try to show it here. You know, we use these lenses, both these lenses. Like I said in the beginning, they looked equal to us. We didn't think too much about them. We realized that one of them has a bigger, has a better magnification, was more expensive as well, in fact, on the shop. But beyond that, we really didn't think much, right? But when we realized that with the with the lens number one, which I've used finally, this focal length is about 23 centimeter. And how do I know this? Well, because when I put it, let's say, um, I mean, my balcony is outside. You can see again, it's forming a nice inverted image. Sky is down. Uh, this is my clothes hanger. There's some buildings that I can see. And when I zoom it in, I can see it fairly clearly. Uh, so this was about 23 centimeter. With the other two, it was, which I'd been using earlier, was 45 centimeter. Now, clearly, a shoebox is not 45 centimeters. 45 centimeters is almost half a meter. Shoebox is not that large. And hence, I realized that I couldn't use this lens. So that was like, first level of loop closing for me that this lens 45 centimeter focal length wouldn't cut for my application so i have to get the unfortunately more expensive one i had to that time it was not still not broken but i had to break it apart and then we had to figure out a way to fix it right so uh, that's how sort of we went about it now what i realized and and this is something i had done before uh, some time back that's why i have these pictures in fact uh, and you guys probably have played with this toy it's very popular with kids a uh, simple little projector, in fact, has the same principle because what happens is there's a light source, there's a lens to sort of focus the light, and then there's one more lens inside this assembly and an inverted image of the picture. Uh, my kids used to love this, in fact, because some doll or something, used to, Barbie or something used to come out on the screen, but the principle is exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, shall I pause here for a moment? If there's any question, uh, anybody or any comment? Anybody? Yeah. Could you explain what the focal length? I'm not uh, exactly sure about that. No problem, no problem. So I'll explain to you. Basically, see, in a in a lens, right? When you have, uh, let's say, and and you can do this experiment if you have a lens at home, right? If you have lots of light rays coming towards a lens, they will converge onto a point. The distance between the lens and the, let's say, where these converge is called the focal length. So, for example, okay, if you, you. yeah, uh, all our glasses that we wear, for instance, right? I mean, it's a little bit more involved, but basically that's the idea. So each of them has a focal length that that allows us to focus better on our retina. I mean, I, in fact, I'll yeah. talk about the eye later on, right? So that's the idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the kind of fundamental property of the lens. Maybe I should have explained better. Thank you. Yeah. So now, once all this happened, I mean, by the way, this all all of this took a few days because you know, first getting the lens, figuring out it's not working, and, and so on. So it's always a process, right? Then putting it in shoe shoebox, that was another process. And in fact, we had to color the shoebox black from inside. So my daughter did all that. Yeah. Uh, 
but then this got me thinking okay then if this is how a projector works and this also must be the basic mechanism in which a camera must work basically we must have light coming to the camera and in the equivalent of my wall for example here i put my image on a wall there must be something on that wall at uh, the equivalent of a wall that lens must be converging the light on there and i must be basically reading that image out right so that's the sort of the thought came that came to me and i was curious because uh, look at a phone today look at a laptop today these you know devices are really really small really thin which means that obviously i'm not dealing with a lens whose focal length is let's say 20 centimeters or 40 centimeters because these things are really tiny tiny right so i was kind of like starting to think about what goes on in there and that's when i realized that well i don't have to think too much you know i can in fact get on with this and take my friend apart which was just lying there for a long while i have many many such things at home but this kind of gave me a motivation to sort of you know take it apart because like i said not working i was telling you earlier that i got this in 2006 uh, much before i guess shreyans and others were born but that time laptops were not there, there but not so prevalent anyway uh, we did not have cameras in the computers we did not have wireless modems also so i had gotten all that set up and i used to use this in fact i used to use this to make some calls and stuff so it's something that i've actually used before right so when i took it apart right the basically like i said the three things that i saw um, and in some sense, the, the the whole, you know, maybe I'll just go back to the slide, right? The whole uh, camera can be broken into three, broken down or sort of into three pieces. One is the lens assembly. We'll talk about this in just a moment. The idea is that basically what happens is the light falls into the lens assembly. So you can see the lens over here. This piece, I guess, guides the light into the right place. I mean, sort of collects the light a little bit. The lens goes and forms an image on the image sensor, just like I was forming an image on the wall. The image sensor data is interpreted from the this third chip over here and passed on using a USB cable to the computer. So that's the sort of high level flow of this. Now, if I were to schematically sort of descri describe it, this is how it goes. There's a lens assembly. Uh, light falls here. The image sensor converts that light into, say, electricity or, say, electric charge to be a bit more precise. Uh, we read out this charge in a charge actually gets converted to voltage. We read out this voltage and we use another chip here to process whatever it is, whatever the image looks like, and that gets uh, you know, transferred to the host PC. Now, if you think about it, the process must remain the same, whether the camera is in laptop or in a phone or in a desktop, but all of this has just become a little bit more integrated. That's why you're not seeing a USB cable outside, but I'm sure there's an interface going back to the, let's say, to the PC. Okay? So what we will do now, if there's no question, I'll just go into each of these a little bit uh, deeper, and then we'll try to again see what happens. How does this whole thing come together? Yeah. Uh, is that okay, Adarsh, uh, Shreyans, Arvind? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's just move forward. You know, like I said, uh, the lens itself, I think the science is relatively straightforward. But that engineering, in my opinion, and in my understanding also, is completely non-trivial. Uh, because, you know, it must collect sufficient light to have it converge on a image sensor. Now, the whole thing is, this whole device itself is so small, the focal length of this is just about a millimeter. In fact, I later confirmed this. I looked at the data sheet of a typical lens, and it turned out that the focal length is 0.9 millimeters. So look at the precision we are talking of. One mm is whatever it is, like really small. We are looking at, you know, something which is smaller than this. And it's logical because, like I said, this lens gets into phones, laptops, and so on. Uh, and it must be precisely placed. But what this means also is that the focal length being so small, any practical object we are looking at, which is, say, even 20 centimeters away, it is effectively, situation is that light is coming from infinity which means that it will get converged onto the, uh, you know, on the, let's say the image sensor, which is placed at, let's say, one millimeter away. So the, there's a kind of light collector. So I'm seeing that here, there's a light collector here. Lens, in fact, I if I, I, I can, I'm able to read through this. It's a clearly a convex lens. And I found out that, you know, uh, there are several challenges in making real lenses because unlike, let's say, this, uh, you know, this, let's say, conceptual diagram, Apparently, it's never so simple. Depending on the lens fabrication, sometimes the focal point itself may be, you know, I mean, may not be a precisely defined point. 
there will be reflection on this lens and so on. So there's a lot of engineering apparently that goes behind it. And uh, recently, you know, I, I don't know if you guys saw this, but there was um, uh, this Surya Tilak conducted at Ayodhya Temple. And I, as I read more about it, I realized that there's also very intricate engineering that went in, in behind it. So again, one of those things where I think the science is relatively, let's say, easy to understand, but still takes a lot of engineering to sort of make it happen, make it in real reality. One example, and I, I kind of looked through this, you know, it took me some time to get to this. Uh, I believe there's a company, I'm not actually very familiar with this space, but uh, this company presumably makes these lenses. Now, this lens, I think, is kind of similar to what we are looking at in the camera that I've torn apart. Uh, the reason I say this is because my uh, there's something called image format. I'll, I'll talk about this is one by four inch for this this camera as well. Focal length is say roughly one millimeter, 0.94 mm. And you know the image circle is so we'll talk about this as well. So basically, there's some parameters here which make me believe that this is kind of what we are I'm looking at. May not be exactly the same, and this is about this much, right? About let's say the whole assembly is say about maybe like one centimeter apart away, right? So this is clearly very precise engineering. You can see a pin here. I mean, this is a good representation, right? So really very precisely placed and and like this is the sort of the main thing of this right now. What does let's say one by four image sensor mean? It'll become more clear when we get into image sensor. It's kind of like the size of this image sensor. And basically what needs to happen is that the lens must form an image which is sort of totally covering the image sensor. That's logical, right? Because if the lens is not forming an image, let's say that's large enough for the sensor or too large for the sensor, it's no use. So I think they kind of um, these two go hand in hand. They precisely sort of match it and you know uh, and build this. So Pretty interesting if you get into the depth of it, but yeah, in in simple words, I think completely non-trivial, very fascinating engineering that goes behind it. Right now, moving to the image sensor. Now, like I said, this and, and we could see it here. In fact, this lens goes and sits perfectly on top of the you know what so kind of tight uh, fastens in, and you can see. I don't know if you can see that the image sensor. If I remove this assembly completely, then the image sensor gets completely visible. Uh, you can see it looks like a screen. Uh, it looks like sort of screen with lots of what we call the bond wires coming out. Uh, we'll look at this in, in just a moment, how this works. But the first thing that caught my eye when I took this apart, I mean, and this really did. This company which has built this is called Agilent. Now, Agilent is actually very well known to me because I've used their equipments a lot uh, as part of my work, but I had never imagined, I did not know at all that Agilent also made image sensors. I, I really do not know this till I took this apart. And this is one thing I always find learning uh, as a matter of learning from, let's say, devices that you learn also not just about the technology, not just about science, but about, let's say, how the industry is organized, which are the companies which make this. And this is good, to, very useful information because, you know, when you read about technical literature, you know, okay, this company does something like this. Perhaps in future, you know, you may want to work with them or you may want to just uh, explore their products and you know where to look for, right? So this is something new for me because uh, turns out that Agilent is very, let's say, big player in this market. I really had no idea uh, because I've used Agilent, but not this. And also it seems, and this is an article from Agilent website, it says in 1999, Agilent technology enabled the first optical mouse. And that's when it hit me that absolutely optical mouse, which also I have taken apart in the past, is really like a little camera, right? And you know that's also quite interesting that how things are actually connected to each other, right? But you know, Agilent being what it is, uh, very well documented. Let's say um, uh, so part numbers and so on. I found the same with their other test equipment and stuff. So this particular sensor that they're using, I managed to get its data sheet and I looked through it quite uh, carefully. Let's say, let's just look at some of the key specifications which I've highlighted. First thing. Uh, the video format that I'm looking at for this particular sensor, which is HTCS 1020, it's what is called SIF. Um, I think it's called some common interface format or something. The main point is it has it is 352 pixels times 288 pixels. So basically like an array of sensors, array of photodiodes of that size. Uh, this is called a Bayer array. We'll, we'll look at this. It can do an 8-bit video of 30 frames per second. Now 30 frames per second is generally good enough for a video um, and it also comes with what is called an analog to digital conversion. So, you know, this it's integrated with this 8-bit ADC. Again, we will look at this in a moment. 
And basically what happens is whatever image this guy is capturing on the uh, image sensor, it gets transferred to, uh, let's say, another chip where a lot of other things happen and, you know, a lot of signal processing, let's say, happens there, right? But let's take a step back and sort of ask ourselves, okay, fine, what exactly is this image sensor? And, and a very good analogy, very good, let's say, um, let's say understanding point comes from our own eyes. Uh, basically, our eyes work in or I should say the other way, cameras work in much the same way as our eyes do. We have a lens. Light enters the eye through the lens and image is formed on the retina. This is then passed on to uh, using the optic nerve to, let's say, our brain where all the processing happens. So if I were to just sort of, you know, take an equivalent to this, an image sensor is basically like our retina, which is converting, let's say, the light falling onto it into some kind of an electrical signal, which can then be analyzed. And the way we do it in the eye, there are rods and cones. If you guys have learned, uh, uh, you know, I mean, from secondary school, sort of we learned this. Uh, rods and cones, rods let, let us see the color. Uh, rods let us see the, the luminance and cones let us see the color. So there's some response for each of these. Uh, in the photodiode, in a, let's say, in a CMOS sensor, what we do is, again, three types of, let's say, uh, diodes, RGB. Now, RGB, uh, you know, from let's say uh, turtle python, we know that RGB are three fundamental sort of colors. Using them, we can get any color. So if you basically look at the similarity here, our eye response, different parts of the eye respond to different colors, let's say. Same way, these, these are elements which respond to, let's say, different colors, and together they form the image, just like our brain puts together, uh, you know, a coherent image. Now, I remember reading this pretty interesting, let's say, um, article from the same article where I got this picture, he says that the ultimate goal of an image system is to replicate the eye because eye is so amazing. It can do like so many things. Um, and apparently we are getting quite close to that. You know, not this camera because this is very old, but apparently things are moving really in that direction. So what happens basically again, you know, in if I look at this particular going back to the data sheet, it turns out that each pixel inside this is seven by seven micrometer now. Just to put this in perspective, and I had to go do a bit of Google search for this. This is the size of a yeast, like you know, bacteria. I think around this size. Yeast is around around this size, so really quite small. But what I also read is today's we are today's uh, cameras and stuff had pixels which are let's say 0.5 micrometers by 0.5 micrometers, and that's why we have gone from let's say these rudimentary resolutions to something like. 8 megapixel or whatever, right? Even more. That's because the pixel size become so small because optics hasn't changed, but we have managed to shrink it all down quite a bit. Um, there's also a bunch of specifications, some of which, I mean, I, I also find it fascinating, but I'm not fully understood them, let's say. Uh, but there's something called fail factor. We'll talk about this. This was quite interesting. And then finally, this optical format, which is telling us how large is the screen. But basically, at every point okay at each of these areas there is let's say uh you know so there's some kind of timing control we'll again talk about this like i said there is a red blue and green amplifier for each of these signals and that is converted to let's say a digital output which then goes to the backend chip so sort of that's how this works uh, i hope i'm kind of giving a picture uh, any questions i can definitely stop here uh adarsh uh, shayans arvind any question no sir no. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the interesting bit again, you know, at high level, everything is, let's say, whatever it is, but the deeper you go into it, you realize that there's a world inside everything, right? So in case of CMOS sensors, uh, in fact, what happens is something basically, like I said, there is lots and lots of these, let's say, photodiode elements in the two dimensional space. So there must be like, you know, inside this, we are looking at something like, let's say, 300 times 300. So almost let's say uh, so 900,000 say elements inside this, I mean 90,000 let's say, you know, uh, such elements in this in this small little area. And each of these, if you see, they follow this thing called the bare matrix. Now this was something totally new to me as well. What I realized is that apparently there are twice as many green sensors as there are blue and red. And this is done because human eye is apparently very sensitive in the green region, so you know, which is around roughly 550 nanometers. So I think this is where engineering is. Science is one thing, but I'm sure through some experimentation, through some let's say testing, uh, people would have figured out that it's better to have two of these, let's say, green pixels for every 
blue and red. And this was done by some engineer who used to work, I believe, in Kodak. Kodak is this company which was very big in cameras those days, but I think now not sure if they're still there. Uh, and he uh, sort of invented this, and that's why it's called a Bayer matrix. So the idea is that there are two greens for every blue and red, and, and that's what happens here. Now, each of these is actually very interesting. So each of these pixels is, again, very interesting because remember, for each of these, there is a light sensing element, and then there is this amplifier because light will sort of light will fall onto this photo sensitive area which is the p here and then a bunch of electronics takes the signal out from let's say that pixel and uh, this is actually quite interesting because what we are saying is that for every pixel some 30 percent or so area is given for the photodiode remaining is all electronics so i i just saw from the htcs uh, you know 1020 that's the sensor that we are using the active area is 42 percent so in fact if you think about this right this is already so tiny but only some 40 percent of this area is being used to uh, sort of capture the image everything else is coming uh, is coming in handy to sort of read it out and so on so really fascinating how you know we have put it all together in such small form factor and it really works right now, if you, like I said, if you were to go even further into this, and you know, again, I, it, this article is very detailed. Maybe I've understood some few percentage of it only, but on each of these, on each of these pixels, which is say seven by seven micron, like a size of a yeast, in today's day and age, apparently it's 0. 0.6 micron by 0. 0.6 micron or even smaller. So let's say hundred times smaller than this. Uh, we are looking at, let's say a photodiode where the actual conversion from light to uh, a charge happens. And then we have a bunch of electronics. But on top of all this, there is this, you know, what they call a micro lens, which further helps to focus the, you remember the light is coming from the main lens. It goes and focuses on the photodiode using this micro lens. Now, again, see the scale of this. It's mind boggling. We have put on this pixel some, let's say 90,000 of these. There are 90,000 uh, photodiodes. There are 90,000, you know, uh, micro lenses. Really amazing uh, how, let's say, um, this, engineering is right i mean semiconductors anyway quite 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 amazing and th this thing just continues to shrink that's why we have more and more uh, you know pixels on our cameras these days but you know if you can sort of let's say gloss over this um technicality of this right how this works is fine i mean this is quite fascinating but end of the day and again this is quite uh, fascinating others will relate to this for sure we had a project in our python curriculum called pixel art basically same idea that each pixel here is represented by an XY coordinate. So remember, there are many, many, many of these, but I can recognize each of these with its own X and Y coordinate. And once I do that, then, you know, really the image is just a matter of figuring out what is on that pixel. So for example, in pixel art, we just do two for loops, uh, it's our nested for loop, one for the row, one for the column. And we are able to make things like, let's say Mario, or uh, this is a student project who did this Harry Potter owl, Another student who did all these other characters, right? So the idea is very similar, uh, which is good to understand because once we have the idea, then the uh, things become more clear. But of course, again, somebody has to do it. Unlike our pixel art, we directly had a pixel X, Y address. We specified what color that pixel must be. But here, somebody or let's say some machine must do it. Some uh, engineering must do it. And how it gets done again at a high level, basically the pixels are read out row by row so this is like an array of pixels uh, believe it or not that's what is in that little thing they are read out row by row for every column so basically we read out you know uh, so sorry row by row so we read out like in this direction for one so it's basically read out every row on the column bus. so yeah there's some let's say xy pattern through which these are read out and then there is processing because this data that has come out is still raw this is not in you know, a form that can process. And again, we will see why that is the case. But this has to be processed to get to the final image. Now, our pixel art sort of was already at this level where we just specified, OK, give me X and Y coordinates of the pixel and I'll color it in that particular way, which was itself quite fascinating. Uh, we could see user for loops in there quite nicely. And uh, students have done, like as you know, uh, very interesting innovations on top of this. But nonetheless, here in the camera, same things going on. What comes out from the bare array itself may look something like this, but after processing, it may look something like this. Now, the question then is, okay, where is this processing happening? And that's where the third part comes in. 
uh, which is the circuit that I saw. Like I told you, there's this image sensor. The other side is this chip. Uh, this is a chip from, uh, you know, uh, ST Microelectronics is a very big European company. Uh, it does a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, microelectronic circuits. This is where this process happens. Now I tried looking for the data sheet for this, which is how we learn about these chips. Couldn't find any, but I did find a similar part, which you know I think is quite similar. Gives a picture. Remember this? Uh, basically, there's a let's say image sensor, not this one, but some image sensor from which the data is coming through from bare data, and this guy is doing all the processing. So you know, not exactly the same data sheet, but gives us the idea, and that kind of links me back to my original schematic. Remember the light gets collected by the lens onto the image sensor that converts it into, let's say, uh, voltage data that is then processed by, let's say, a chip like this. And finally, USB data packets are sent to the PC for the image to form. Now, again, without getting into, let's say, specifics, but let's just see some, some you know, uh, let's say, algorithms that are run. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm, I, I, this is not my area. I, I would love to, you know, know these more because they're very mathematical, uh, very, like, uh, image processing is, I, I, I've studied this in bachelor's days. Beautiful subject because really visually you can see things. Uh, but I just got this from the list that you know the earlier document had, right? What all needs to happen post this bare phrasing and, and you know, let's say defective pixel correction. Uh, I'm sure they build this in reality. There are a lot of impairments that get in, and those are all corrected. Uh, so one of the things that is done is what they call demosaicing. Remember, the bare array is giving us data, two greens, red, and blue at every pixel. So there's like two pixel, two pixel. Uh, so that is sort of one unit, but image must appear much more coherent, much more human-like. So somebody needs to sort of, you know, uh, combine them all. That's called demosaicing. Now this is like a, a running a matrix filter on top of a two-dimensional, uh, let's say, uh, array. Uh, highly, uh, let's say, interesting uh, mathematical operation. Some multipliers you can see order the order of the operation, but yeah, nice this thing. Next, they do something called gamma correction. Now, again, gamma correction, the idea is that what the camera saw, what the sensor saw versus what our eye receives are, why eye perceives are different. And remember, the goal of this system is ultimately be as close as possible to the eyes because only then that will look natural. Otherwise, it will not be that great. So you do some correction for the luminance. And again, this is standard. Let's say, basically look at every value and see where it fits into this line, map it to something else. So it's kind of like, lookup table based or maybe some nonlinear function which does this. And finally, there's something not finally one more operation here is some white balance. Uh, again, you know, if you don't do again, this, I'm just picking up from some document. If you don't do white balance correction, look at this image versus this image. It's OK. This one tells you there's an apple, banana, grapes and so on. But definitely this looks more realistic, more, let's say, richer in, in the features that we see. And again, you can imagine that there's no limit to this. There's you know, um, lots of algorithms that run, but the important point to understand is that by this time, you know, by the time we are in this chip, we are no longer dealing with light alone. We are no longer dealing with charges either. In fact, we are dealing with real numbers which have come from the you know from all those physical phenomena, which means that these algorithms are going to be very very mathematical, right? These are things that we can run. As a Python program, for example, so you know, unlike let's say building a lens or understanding, let's say that uh, CCD uh, or say the CMOS sensor, uh, we can run this on let's say uh, uh, like mathematics, right? Literally, literally, what's called digital signal processing, right? Uh, there are apparently many algorithms, and nowadays, if you think about it, I think on top of all this, people are running AI. So, for example, your phone recognizes a face or recognizes, let's say, uh, even you sometimes because it has seen you many times and it does a class classification that okay this looks like you right and a face right so when i put multiple people on a camera it kind of circles all the faces but really the the basic principles have not changed just that this data now is being processed more and more to sort of make it better and extract more information from it so that's the important point uh, some other aspects of this you know again those in interested in electronics will probably is important anyway uh, so one thing you notice that you know the the image sensor and the PC the 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 other chip are placed back to back, and this is quite interesting because remember, a lot of data has to flow between these two. In fact, from the image sensor, a lot of stuff has to go in here. Now, what they have done by doing 
this essentially is that they have, you know, uh, they have most likely this PCB is, I do not know how to find out exactly, but this is not a two layer PCB. This definitely wires in between. Through that, this signals have been routed and that helps because then the PCBs can be small, traces are minimal, and also there are lesser interference to other things. Now, all these are consumer devices. They go through stringent, let's say, regulatory uh, approvals, which also includes EMI, ele electromagnetic interference, right? So these things will, I think, help the way they have tightly mounted it. Of course, apart from keeping the device small. We can see a crystal here. Now, crystal is piezoelectric, so when we feed electricity, it starts to vibrate. Um, and that is used for in almost everything in all electronics. So this is the crystal here, 12 megahertz. I suspect it's, you know, uh, one of these chips, most likely this ST chip is taking this crystal and con using a phase lock loop to, let's say, derive other clocks, which is being used then in the, um, you know, in the image sensor. And also we can see a bunch of power supply stuff. And again, that's, I think, because this is USB powered. So USB is five volts. In fact, Arvind gave a very nice, uh, you know, trick recently how we can use these USB uh, connectors to uh, get this 5 volt out very nice. They is basically just tear it apart a little bit. Uh, but I think these devices are all 3.3 volts, so there must be some kind of conversion that's going on in this piece. Now, again, these are important parts, not to, uh, you know, these are all like world of in them their own, how this conversion happens. None of this is trivial. But from our point of view, I want to focus on the, let's say, the, the image processing part of it, right? So, one thing that I try to do, and I always try to do this, in fact, right? I just, this time I kind of wrote down, right? How, just try to go back, okay? Before this camera existed, how did this camera come to be, right? In fact, the whole process is quite interesting because let's say I was Logitech. I was, let's say, the product designer of this. And I'm sure there was some person somewhere who has taken the responsibility of this as a product. Um, he or she has said that, okay, this is how the product will look. Of course, a team of designers will do it for, uh, for them. Uh, Decided, you know, how the industrial design is, how this should be, let's say, round in shape with this form factor and, and so on. So they have decided this based on market needs and so on. Uh, they have done the industrial design. They have done the uh, PCB design for this, you know, which is basically this portion. The PCB is printed circuit board where these things uh, fall in, which are the chips we use and so on. But behind this Logitech, there is at least, okay, and there could be more, there's at least five suppliers. Uh, this is, again, you know, based on, my let's say experience of working in the industry there's no document for this but my sort of hypothesis right there must be somebody who has supplied the lens because this like i said is a specialized event um for that recent surya tilak i learned that the lens was built by a factory in bangalore right, recently so you know this this is a specialized job I, I really think some few vendors do it um and and, and they would have supplied it there's obviously agilent in the picture agilent like i said very big company um Lot of test and measurement equipment. They have provided the CMOS sensor. There is ST Micro in the picture who has provided us that, that image processing chip. There are at least actually four I've just done, but there are many here who have provided us, for example, the crystal, the discretes, uh, you know, the, the capacitors and so on and so forth, uh, the regulators. And somebody must have provided the plastic. So some, you know, this design would have gone to some vendor who would have fabricated this. And my reckoning is that, you know, in the factory, they would have collected all these things together, soldered them. This happens with the machine these days. I mean, uh, 2006 also is just happened with machines. What Logitech has done, in fact, is to sort of put it all together as a product, brand it, package it, distribute it, make sure it's available for people to sell. When we look at it, we think of it as Logitech, but behind this is a lot of engineers uh, behind any product. And I do this because, you know, this gives you a sense of how much our economy uh, uh, has, let's say, you know, pro progress. So to build something like this at scale for a price of, I mean, this, I don't know how much it was, but it definitely wasn't very expensive because, I, you know, I bought it in 2006. I am generally not the highest end buyer, right? So it must have been a reasonably priced thing, which I could comfortably afford. And the amount of science mathematics that gone into this is tremendous. Also, the amount of, let's say, uh, you know, the, the logistics of this, the whole thing is quite interesting. The other thing to why I do this is because once we compartmentalize it this way, then you can start thinking, okay, where is it that innovation is going on? And my guess is in all of these segments, innovation is happening all the time. For example, you know, the lenses will become better. Uh, the CMO sensors are becoming more dense. Lenses must follow. Image processing chip must follow. 
their current carrying capacities will be changing. Hence, all this must change and designs have to keep evolving. Uh, probably webcams today look different. I do not know. There are more requirements and so on. So this innovation at all points and there's room for, you know, let's say uh, uh, creativity at all steps, just a different skill set required. Uh, one thing that also, you know, was interesting to me is that if I look at it and map it to something that I'm much more comfortable with, let's say an RF communications receiver. In fact, this whole thing looks quite intricate to me. The image, let's say the image sensor engineering is really, uh, let's say quite detailed. And then we have all these, let's say signal processing to correct that images and so on. But, you know, the reflection was something which I think very much closer to my, uh, let's say daily work. Is that you know what happens let's say in your phones or your wi-fi routers and so on there is a receiver always which is picking up signals from the air and you know converting it to useful let's say data when we build these circuits inevitably there are impairments and, and any any communication engineer will uh, you know recognize these there are inevitable impairments and which is why i could relate that okay image, image sensor built at such scale will have impairments it's a given right but Usually we use digital techniques to sort of, uh, you know, correct them. That's mathematical. So this is a lot of circuit design stuff. Anything that happens in here is really mathematics. Uh, we can uh, do it in Python, but it's sort of, you know, Python or say MATLAB or it's a C or whatever. Uh, but this is really, you know, uh, based on some physical principles. So it's not just, just programming. You have to understand the domain. So that's why the whole thing comes together. It's something I thought about. Uh, like I said, if you look at the recent advances, the image sensors are, it's not must be. In fact, they are, they are much more dense now. I just read this morning that, you know, they are less than a micrometer apart and some newer ideas have been put together because as you go closer and closer, some other impairments start coming in. And this is true in general in semiconductors, the nature of transistors is changing. Uh, when I started my career, uh, actually, I don't know, like, you know, when I was in 2000. 10, they were doing 40 nanometer chip that was considered really advanced. But the last chip that I worked on was like 15 nanometer, one five. And you know, that's, it's actually significant, right? So uh, I think optics must have become more precise as a result, like I just spoke, the amount of data being transferred must be much higher. The larger the picture, the more processing, the more data. And we know that these things have actually got integrated into phones. So no more USB. Uh, and also they have this AI enabled feature. So AI, obviously people are talking about it a lot these days, but I always tell everybody that you know AI has been around. Your phones are a very good example. When you turn on the camera, the fact that it recognizes the face is an application of AI. Right? So uh, this will never stop. Things will always keep moving. There's room for advancement for everybody. But then I would like to thought end this with a thought. You know, in very high likelihood, despite me me having manhandled this quite badly, I have a strong feeling that the electronics of this still works quite well because these things are built you know uh, in very precise manners electronics almost there's no moving part in the electronics electronics almost never fails can we somehow put this to some use maybe you know if let's say the um, the video formats are not proprietary you know it'll be really good if you can access let's say what's the usb data coming out and process it in say python or say opencv to figure out you know whatever i was showing you here do I, let's say, you know, let's say this image, right? Uh, to do something like this, and, and that will be really nice, right? Then we really understand what's going on uh, and so on. If somebody is interested in doing this, I'll be very happy to explore, right? And in general, I hope, you know, uh, this talk motivates you to think about these gadgets a bit more carefully because they are really, really treasure troves of knowledge. Uh, you know, the moment you analyze them in detail, in fact, there's much more detail possible here, but the, the moment you analyze them in detail, you start realizing how a product is built how let's say uh, innovation happens and how these different pieces come together. So one thing I did mention, it's actually very important, is the entire software that controls all that. That must also have been done by Logitech, I guess, with all these things built on top, right? Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll be happy to hear any thoughts and you know, uh, let's say um, feedback on this. Uh, Arvind, uh, Shreyans or uh, others? I have a doubt. Yes, please. Um, like I don't understand the role of that crystal. Okay, good. Very good that you asked. Okay, so crystal is basically, uh, see, almost every device has a crystal. Crystal is like a heartbeat for the system. So what happens with the crystal? You know, there's something called piezoelectric. Piezoelectric means that when I apply electricity to something, it starts to vibrate. So what happens in a yeah, crystal when we 
Yeah, so when we apply a crystal, let's say, uh, let's say electricity to this crystal, it starts to vibrate at 12 megahertz. All right. Now this 12 megahertz yeah. is then because you remember we need to give a clock to sort of read out all this, right? Read out this uh, data from the image sensor. So this yeah. clock will be generated from, let's say, the crystal. Now, mm. if you if you take apart, let's say, a simple watch, no, not a watch, let's say a clock, a wall clock, right? You can see the crystal there as well because crystal there is creating the tick, tick, tick. In fact, that crystal is, uh, uh, vibrates at 32, 3, 2, 7, 6, 8, 2 to the power of some 13 or something, whatever, uh, 15, I guess, right? So uh, uh, times a second, and that's how the, the watch counts one second, two second, three seconds. Good questions. Crystals are part of everything, actually. Yeah, like your heartbeat. Okay. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yes, my pleasure. Sure. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Any other questions? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I can hear okay. you. Yeah. So I hope, uh, yeah, Shriyans and Adarsh found this very inspiring. In fact, uh, any electronic product, if you do a tear down like this, you will find the details of its inner working. And if you're curious enough, you can, uh, you know, go up uh, go and look up the data sheets and other resources online and find out more. So the more research you put into these things, the more you will learn about uh, how the product works. And eventually you will be in a position to build such a product yourself. Yeah. So this is very important because today most of the electronic products we are importing from outside the country. So we need young engineers like you. I mean, potentially you will become engineers in the future. So you will uh, be become curious. You will start building these things on your own. So that's how you know India can become self-sufficient. We can start making all these products uh, yeah. uh, on our own. Yeah. And there is nothing, uh, uh, you know, it's not rocket science. Once you do it step by step, try to understand the basics it is possible to do something like this. Yeah, so yeah. you should have the interest and the curiosity to do it. Yeah, I agree with that totally. It's not rocket science, just logical step-by-step -step analysis. And you will have questions, that's okay. There's still a lot of questions we have, right? Slowly they get answered. So any other points uh, from the audience? If not, I want to share something which I thought is relevant. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. I'll share my screen. Yeah. yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, one minute. Yeah, I do see your screen. Yeah. So this is Samsung Galaxy X23. I suppose one of the recent, yeah, it was announced last year. So it is like a fairly recent uh, phone. Yeah. And one of the high-end phones, Galaxy S23. And if you look at the camera specs, I will zoom in a little bit so you can see here camera specs, yeah. main yeah. camera, selfie camera, and you will notice the focal length kind of 26 mm, 24 mm, 70 mm. Yeah. But actually, in a smartphone camera, you don't have even this kind of space. 70 yeah. mm is like 7 centimeters. This is 2.4 centimeters. You yeah. don't have this kind of space. So that begs the question. How, how are they able to fit in a 24 mm focal length into a smartphone? So the answer is that what I found out just reading uh, while the presentation is going on. The thing is, these numbers are quoted mainly to uh, uh, for parity with the traditional yeah. cameras, SLR yeah. cameras. Right. So if you take a because that is what photographers are used to. They are used to these kind of numbers. So if you take a traditional SLR camera, if you tell a photographer this is 70 mm, immediately he will know it's a telephoto lens. If you tell him this is 24 mm, he will know what what kind of uh, lens it is, uh, what kind of pictures he can take. So for the photographer's uh, uh, familiarity, they are quoting these numbers. Yeah. But actually, physically, if you measure, uh, it is actually much smaller than this. This is probably... In reality, this is probably only 4 mm or less. It'll be less so than that. That is what I found out. Yeah. It'll be less than that. Yeah. So this is 35 mm. They call it 35 mm equivalent. I also yeah. found out recently when I was I had the same yeah. question actually, 
And also now we can see Arvin that this is a one by 1.56 inch, right? So that's like what we are look, looking at. It's I think the size of the image sensor is not all that large. So yeah. it's just yeah. the image. There's just one micrometer is probably the image sensor uh, like pixel size or something like that, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. really crammed onto that thing, right? It's quite amazing, man, how this whole thing comes yeah. out. Yeah. Another important uh, number from a photographer's point of view is the F length. Mm -hmm. So this is also important. Uh, F length is nothing but it is something like this. It is the ratio of the focal length to the diameter of the aperture. Right, focal length uh, to the aperture diameter. So suppose something like this. Here it is F1. Here is F divided by two. That means now the uh, uh, the aperture is uh, different. Focal length right, is different. Right, right. And uh, the why these numbers.